There's the word urban myth. There's a possibility that it might be a true story, but there's also the possibility that it's not a true story, but it's just a really good story. Okay. This is a great story about the Polish concert pianist Jan Paderewski. Paderewski, I got it. <coughs> As the story goes, Paderewski is doing a concert in his home country of Poland, and he's in a big concert hall, and the crowd is coming in, and there is, with this crowd, there's a mom who brought her nine-year-old boy. Never been to anything like this before. He hasn't. She's trying to get him interested in taking piano lessons. Any of you take piano lessons? Did you when you were young? How many of you took them with your own mom as a teacher? Ask me how well that worked out. No, don't. Don't ask that. Well, the boy's sitting out here with his mom. He looks up on the stage. He thinks the piano looks really cool. So when mom wasn't paying attention, he slipped up on stage, walked up to the piano, sat down on the bench, and because there's all kinds of noise going on, he starts playing chopsticks. It bothered everybody who had come to hear a concert because while chopsticks is kind of a, a fun for a while, it becomes an irritating song very quickly if that's all you're playing, okay? Because they were waiting for this famed concert pianist and they're all wondering, where is this kid's parents, okay? And they're wondering what Paderewski is gonna do when uh, he walks out. How is the maestro gonna respond to somebody messing up his concert by playing chopsticks? Okay, so the parents, everybody's out there expecting the security to show up and take the kid away. But much to their surprise, Paderewski himself comes walking out onto the stage. Instead of getting mad, Paderewski goes up and puts both arms around the child who's still playing chopsticks on the keyboard and Paderewski starts to improvise on either side of him and now they're playing a duet. As the story goes, while he's playing, Paderewski is whispering into the kid's ear the whole time. He's telling him, just keep going, don't quit. You keep playing, I'll keep playing, and we'll do something everybody will remember. By the time the night was over, Paderewski had played all of his great pieces out of his repertoire, but the highlight, the moment that nobody will ever forget is when he played a duet to chopsticks with a nine-year-old kid. Because they get to listen as this maestro takes a mess, basically, and turns it into something unforgettable. Again, I, I tried, I've tried every time I've used that story to find out whether it's actually true, but there's not a lot to go on. Probably an urban myth. But it's one of those stories that just keeps getting told. Why does it never go away? Why is it still being told to this day? <coughs> Excuse me. I think the reason why we continue to use that story is because most of us know what it's like to play, play chopsticks. In fact, we could take that and apply it to our lives. We're all playing chopsticks and we're kind of hoping that somebody will come along and set this mess straight. Especially because we need that kind of help. We find ourselves in places where life isn't turning out the way that we planned. And we're not exactly sure what to do. It's not what we anticipated. It's a mess. Has your life ever been a mess? And we wonder, how is it going to turn out? Is there anybody that can pay the price to come and set us straight? Well, somebody asked the great theologian R.C. Sproul, what is the greatest need, greatest spiritual need in the world today? They asked him, that was the question, what is the greatest spiritual need in the world today? And his response was this. He said, the greatest need in people's lives is to understand the true identity of God. He said, that's the greatest need. He said, a lot of people who reject faith think that they reject faith, but they don't really understand <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry. They don't understand the nature of the God that they think that they're rejecting. They don't really understand it. 
So there was a follow-up question, which is very similar to the first one. The follow-up question was, what's the greatest need in the lives of believers today? And his answer was the same, to understand the true identity of God. He went on to say, because if believers understood the true identity of God, then that would affect what's in our hearts. That's what affects how we look at God. It would change our lives. It would change what we say. It would change how we worry, and it would change how we live. So that's what we're going to do for the next several weeks. We're going to devote ourselves to thinking, which is already going to be a chore for some of us, right? Okay. We're going to try to renew our minds. We're going to learn about the most important question that human beings can ever ask. And the question is this, what is God like? What is God like? And the great thing is we don't have to start from scratch on this. There are wonderfully rich and incredible uh, tidbits of wisdom available to us, most of which are found in the pages of Scripture. And every one of these writers that we're going to be looking at has a certain name or a certain image that they want us to get when we think about God. So we're going to look at a different one every week. They'll teach us something about God. And I just want to warn you that it has the potential to change our lives. So we're going to start back at the beginning. If you have a Bible, grab it, or you're using your smartphone. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. We're going to trace the introductory part of Genesis and look at how God revealed himself to human beings. Because there's a pattern in this where human beings keep messing up. I know you're surprised, but it's a little bit like playing chopsticks. And in each one of these situations, God does something redemptive. That's going to be a key word for us to think about is redemption. God gives these little gifts of grace until the story hits a certain point. And today what we're going to see is a pattern, okay? I want you to watch for this pattern. It's a pattern of fall, making mistakes, going down, and then redemption, how God brings something good out of it. And it starts with God creating a human being And then he gives a command. And this is in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. It'll be on the screen as well. Beginning in verse 16, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from the tree in the garden, from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. Now, a lot of us have heard that before. But I want to suggest that a lot of people have misunderstood this. The idea is not that if man eats from a certain tree, he's going to gain the ability to know right from wrong. And don't get me, that would be a great ability, wouldn't it? To always know in every situation what's right, what's wrong, and always do the right thing. But the idea here is that by eating from this tree, man would be saying, okay, everybody, now... I get to decide what's good and evil without any help from God. Thank you very much. I don't need to worry about making my life fit in with the way things are designed to be. In other words, what man would be saying is, I can be my own God. And that's really what's at stake in this whole story, is man and woman saying, I can be, we can be our own gods. So in this moment, God is allowing them to make a choice. Do you want to be in community with me? Do you want me to be your God? Or do you want to be your own God? Got that story? Got that part? We understand that, okay? Then, next part of the story, the tempter in the form of a serpent comes to the woman. Now, one of the things you need to understand as we're going through this is that when God originally gave the command that we just looked at, Eve wasn't there. So she has to rely on what the man says in order for her to understand. So question for all the women in the room. How many of you have ever known a man? (laughs) Yeah. Have any of you ever had a kind of situation where the man does not give you fully detailed accounts of his conversations during the day. 
like there's a communications glitch. You, some of you have experienced that, okay? The serpent goes after the woman who was not present to hear what God had said to the man. And in scripture, there's a long conversation. And what happens here is the serpent begins to plant doubts in her mind as to whether or not God can be trusted. Here's what the serpent actually says, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Did God, this is a serpent's question, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Did God actually say that they couldn't eat from any tree in the garden? We just read it. No, God didn't say that, okay? This is an incredible misquote. Part of what happens in temptation is we are tempted to think, I cannot trust that God has my best interest at heart. So I'm going to have to look out for myself. Have you ever felt that way? Like nobody else is looking out for me? I'm going to have to look out for myself. <coughs> we think it would not be safe or wise for me to just give my own well-being into the hands of somebody else. So uh, eventually the woman gives in and eats from the tree and she gives some to her husband, who by the way was there on the day when God gave that command, and he eats it with her. And scripture tells us that the eyes of both of them are opened. And that's kind of the way temptation still works to this day. Think about it, there's a truth, there's something that we value, there's something we believe. And we're tempted to violate that belief. Temptation looks good, doesn't it? If you're going to Weight Watchers and you see that cream-filled long john, have you ever noticed at that moment how that food starts talking to you? Yeah, it's temptation. It, it, it's very much temptation. We didn't have any cream-filled long johns today, did we? Good, I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. And the more that it talks to you, the more tempted we are, and finally we give in to it, and we eat that long john. Then comes the guilt and the shame. Now, <coughs> in this fall that we see Adam and Eve make, something happens to human nature. It's a word that we don't use much anymore. In fact, I will give you extra credit points if you can figure out how to work this into your conversation with your friends later this week, okay? It's an important word, but uh, I, I think we need to understand it. It helps us understand what's at stake in redemption. And here is your Reader's Digest word for the week, depravity. You just used that in conversation yesterday, didn't you? You told somebody, what a depraved mind you have. Okay, maybe that's not the right way you want to say it. But what happens to the human heart is that it's not working real well anymore. It's like glass is predisposed to shatter, like nitroglycerin is predisposed to explode. We are predisposed to do something wrong if we think it's necessary to get what we really want or to avoid what we don't want, we will lie, gossip, cheat, slander, lust, covet, and hate in order to get something. And here's the biggest problem. We can't fix this in us. Turn to the person next to you and just say to them, not even you. Go ahead, just tell them right now. Not even you, okay? We can't fix this in us. And most of the mess in our world today is this word depravity. So let's get back to our story. Here's what's going on in Genesis. God creates, and I'm gonna do a little check and balance system here. So you make sure that for every high point I give you, there's also a low point. Because that's the way life is, right? Do you live on high points all the time? No, it doesn't happen that way. So here's what happens in Genesis. God creates everything perfect, right? So that would be high point number one. God made everything perfect. He makes human 
beings in his own image, and they decide this is a great deal, right? No. They decide they would rather be their own gods. Then their eyes are opened, and that's where the fall happens. This would be low point number one. Okay? Everything was high, and now we made a bad choice, and now it's low point number one, and because of that, there's a distancing that happens between God and man. So then God comes back in verse 9, and he says to Adam, where are you? Where are you? Now, you need to understand, God isn't confused about where Adam is. Okay? Some of us already knew this. God is giving Adam a chance to come clean. Okay? God already knows the story. God already knows God doesn't lack information. So he asks Adam this question because he's inviting Adam to interact with him. He says, come on, you know, it, it, you can come clean. You can tell me the truth. Adam, where are you? And then Adam gives his answer in verse 10. He says to God, I heard you and I was afraid because I was naked. That word afraid, there had never before in scripture, never before been fear as a part of human existence. It used to be that when God came and went for a walk with the man and the woman, it was a good thing, right? They loved taking those evening walks with God. But now Adam says, I heard you and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Then in verse 11, God says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from that tree that I told you not to eat from? It's like, you, know, you feel like your parents are standing right there, you know? So now, now this is a really important point. Adam reflects at this moment on the importance of taking personal responsibility for his actions, as we try to teach all of our kids, right? Take personal responsibility. He summons up his courage. And then in verse 12, he says, it was the woman. <laughs> but that's not all that he says. He says, it was the woman you put here with me. It was the woman you gave me. God, back when it was just you and me, everything was great. So God, please, no more of this bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh stuff. It was the woman you gave me. And from that point on, blaming has entered into history. Do you think that will be the last couple that will ever blame each other? I had a friend who had a magnet on his refrigerator and it said this. It said, I didn't say it was your fault. I just said I was going to blame you. It happens. That's the way it is in the human heart. So because of that, Adam and Eve have to leave the garden and they settle, and we're going to see this in just a moment, they settle east of Eden. Now remember that phrase, east of Eden, because it's going to come back into the story a couple, month, a couple more times. And I hope you understand that's not just geography that we're talking about. Israel had a natural boundary to the west, which was the Mediterranean Sea. The east is where their enemies were. East is the place of danger and alienation. So where do they settle? East of Eden. But before they do, God makes them a promise. God says in verse 15 that the day is coming when there will be a child born, a son of Adam and Eve. And God says the serpent is going to strike his heel but he, this child, is going to crush the serpent's head. <coughs> Excuse me. Temptation, guilt, and death are going to meet their match one day. They don't get the last word, not even in our lives. And that day came, and that man was Jesus. So this was the very first promise that would ultimately be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The first prophetic mention of Jesus comes in response to the very first sin. See what I mean by the high points and the low points? But God's response is that God is going to do something to bring good out of a situation that is bad. God will provide 
a way home for the human race. Now let me do a couple more little uh, redemptive notes here about this story. We're told that Adam and Eve are naked and ashamed, right? Okay, verse 21. Can you put that up on the screen for me, verse 21? It says, And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And, and there's kind of a little tender detail in the story here. God, remember, we, what have we just read in Genesis 1 and 2? God who created all the heavens and the earth now becomes a tailor. Okay? He makes them a set of clothes. You want to talk about a designer later? You take that coat off and it says what? Made by God, right? Yeah. So God is covering them. He's clothing them so that they can come into his presence without shame. But you also notice what it's made out of. These garments are made of skin. For the first time in history, blood is shed. Innocent blood is shed so that their shame can be covered so that their fellowship with God could be redeemed. Now, it's going to come at a cost, but what I want you to understand as we go through this, God is setting the stage for something bigger that's coming. One more little note of grace here, and that is that Adam and Eve, I'm thinking, must have wondered after they blew it, after they got thrown out of the garden, um, is God going to continue his plan? And if you remember what his plan was, his plan was eventually to fill the earth with human beings. But did they blow that? Is it just going to be them for the rest of eternity? Did they mess it up so bad that the dream that God had was dead? And then one day something started happening to Eve. She starts feeling a little nauseous. She gets a little moody. She starts having these strange cravings. You understand, this is all new for him, this her. This has never happened before. And Adam, ever the understanding, caring husband, goes, Hey, Eve, are you putting on a little weight? <laughs> Eve, your clothes don't fit like they used to. Am I going to have to go out and kill a larger animal to get a skin this time? In chapter 4, verse 2, it tells us that Eve gave birth to Cain. Interesting. And she adds this, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Do we have chapter 4, verse 2 that we can put up on the screen? Got that one. Okay. I have brought forth a man. Now, you notice when she says this, she says, I gave birth to Cain. With the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. Who is not mentioned in any of this conversation? The husband. The husband is not mentioned. And this is typical of women to this day. Yeah, men are going, yeah, be careful. I, I want you to be able to eat lunch, so be careful. But I've noticed that when women give birth, they mention God a lot. But they really don't express their appreciation to their husbands. And men, that is just part of the burden that we must bear. Okay? But I want you to understand, every time Adam and Eve look at Cain, they're reminded of God's grace. He was their little bundle of redemption. God did not let their sin mess up the dream. Okay, so he's a redeemer. This is high point number two. God redeems the situation, okay? Then another son comes along, and his name is Abel. Now, question for those of you that went to Sunday school or vacation Bible school, did Cain and Abel get along really well? No, they did not. Not at all. Uh, in fact, Cain is consumed by envy and hatred. But in the middle of this story, we see the heart of a redeemer God again. God comes to Cain before Cain does something wrong. But wouldn't that be something if Right before you do something wrong, every time, if God would show up and say, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh if God would do something like that. H have you ever talked to somebody and you know they're about to do something really dumb? And you know it. And so what do you do? You try to warn them. But they won't listen to you. Have you ever had that experience? Don't point at the person next to you. Imagine being God. 
in the very beginning, we're told that God would just speak it and it would come to pass. Whatever God says happens. That's how creation starts. He just speaks the stars into place. But now he comes to Cain and Cain is considering doing something very bad. And God says, Cain, don't hate your brother. Cain, sin is knocking at the door. Don't let it master you. It's just let, let's let some love into the situation because right now there is no love in this situation. And so God speaks and it is not so because Cain kills his brother Abel. This would be what we call low point number two. Okay, things are getting worse. Now remember the first one had to do with Adam and Eve being tempted to do wrong. And this one has to do with Cain. Cain is not only tempted, God is trying to talk him out of doing the wrong thing and do the right thing, but Cain won't listen. With Adam and Eve, it all had to do with a piece of fruit, right? But with Cain, it's murder and hatred towards his brother. So this is what we're told, I think, in chapter 4, verse 16. Do we have that? Yeah. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence. And this next part is very sad and lived in the land of Nod. Where did he go? East of Eden. See, the truth is Cain is afraid that somebody's going to kill him. You say, well, why would he be that? Because he unleashed murder into the world. But God is going to do something else redemptive. In chapter 4, verse 15, you can look at that for yourself. God places a mark on him. It's something physical so that when you looked at Cain, you saw this physical mark, and that becomes the high point. He's protecting Cain. And the idea, and I don't know how God pulls all this stuff off. Do you know how God works? If you do, you're preaching next week, okay? And we'll be happy to let you do that. But the idea is that this mark on Cain would be a warning to the human race against further bloodshed. So God, among other things, is protecting Cain. So there's a little bit of grace here. And the idea is that maybe when people see that mark on Cain, whatever it was, or maybe when they hear the story, maybe they'll learn. Maybe brothers will not hate each other. Maybe people will not go to war against each other. God is working to bring something good out of something bad. But I'm sorry to tell you that things keep getting worse. Low point number three? Three. We're at low point number three. Chapter six, Genesis chapter six, verse 11. It says, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become. Now let's just stop right there. He saw how corrupt the earth had become. This language is very descriptive. That phrase where it says, God saw, that's the very same phrase that we see in the opening chapters of Genesis. When God was creating, remember, it says God spoke and it came to be, and God saw, what? That it was good. Everything that God saw at that point was good. And this is the first time that that phrase is brought back right here in chapter 6. Only this time God looks and does not see that it was good. God saw that it was corrupt. It was bad. It was ruined. And the rest of that verse says, and his, God's heart, was deeply troubled. Think about your heart. Think about how when somebody you love messes up and your heart is broken for them. So then think about the heart of God who loves every human being way more than any of us do. Can we understand that? Way more than any of us do. His heart is broken by every one of us that goes down a self-destructive path. I can only think how much pain we have caused the heart of God. I cannot even imagine, don't want to imagine what it must be like to be God. So God sends a flood. But again, he begins with a man named Noah. It's okay, it's a safe answer, okay? You pretty much knew that was coming. 
So one more time, there's a little note of grace. This would be high point number four. Number four. Number four. Mm. God sees all the violence on earth, but instead of God saying, I'm out of here, it's vacation time, instead of destroying it, God binds himself to the human race by making a promise. And in the Bible, it's called a covenant. He makes a covenant with Noah and his descendants. He says he's going to send a sign for this covenant to remind everybody. Do you remember what that sign was? The rainbow, chapter 9, verse 13. And the idea is that whenever people see the rainbow, I'm sorry, they're not going to think about the rainbow coalition. And they're not going to think about whatever pride. They're going to think about what God did to remind everybody that he brought good into the world. It's a rainbow. They'll think about how good it is to be alive. They'll turn away from violence and corruption. But they don't. And that gets worse. Low point number four. Don't ever underestimate the words that God uses in a story to get you and I to think. Chapter 11, Genesis 11, verse 2. As people moved, which way? We see a pattern here in Scripture. The spiritual direction of the human race is to move away from God and to move away from what God wanted. People, we're still doing it today. It says they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Let's go on to verses 3 and 4. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone. And we'll come back to that, okay? You've read that all your life and didn't know what does that matter. Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. The language in this is loaded, okay? God had said originally that he was going to make human beings in his image, okay? And he told them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, have dominion over everything, only now they don't want to do that. They want to collect all in one place. They want to kind of get, let's all get together. They don't want to honor God. You notice what it said? They want to make a name for themselves. Now, these are the people, remember, that are wearing designer clothes. God made, okay? They're saying, you know what? It's not about God anymore. It's all about me and my life. I don't want to bend the knee to God. They want to occupy the place that only belongs to God. And then it says, we will be like God. Same old story. Same old sin. Same old language. They get all puffed up by what they are able to do. It's really amazing, isn't it? That there used to be a place on earth where people allowed mere human intelligence and technology to make them feel arrogant and superior to anybody else. Mm-hmm. What a strange thing. You gotta understand as the writer is telling the story, he is ridiculing human arrogance. The story is very artfully told. Now let's go back to that brick and stone thing here, okay? The writer says they used brick instead of stone. The readers of Genesis originally would have noticed that immediately. In Babylon, which is the home of Babel, they constructed with brick in ancient times. But the Israelites never did that. The Israelites used stone. Those of you that know anything about construction, which will last longer, stone or brick? Stone will, okay? It's the writer's way of saying to the people that are listening, they think they're building like God, but they don't even know enough to build with stones. See, it's the foolishness of human arrogance that's being shown here in the building of the Tower of Babel. It's not going to last. That's what he's really saying. It's going to come down. Chapter, or verse 5. Let's go to verse 5 of that same chapter. But the Lord came down to see the city. Did you catch anything? The Lord did what? 
see a direction in that? And what had they just talked about? We're going to build something. We're going to go up into the heavens. We're going to be like God. It, it, they're going to build their way up, right? But God, in order to see what they're doing, he's got to come down. And God knows that the human capacity for evil and violence goes unchecked. These people will destroy themselves. Have you ever, have you ever wondered why we haven't already done that in this world? With the capacity we have for bombs and starvation and everything else, how is it that evil and violence seem to go unchecked? Why is it that we haven't already destroyed ourselves? It's because God restrains us. And he scatters these people all over the earth. There's a further loss of community. And just in case you're curious, that's the end of the introduction to Genesis. Everything's about to change, okay? So for the readers of Genesis, reading this the first time, they would see this pattern that I've tried to point out to you. There's a fall, and then God does something redemptive. Then there's another fall, but God does something redemptive. There's even more fall, and God does even more redemptive. And you have Babel, and you come to the end of chapter 11, and really, if you didn't have another page to turn to, there's nothing else. And so you would wonder, is this it? Same thing that Adam and Eve wondered in the garden. Have we gone too far? Have we been too bad? Have we messed up so much? Well, friends, this is human life. This is not just the history of the world. This is you and me. Have we messed up so bad that there's nothing that can be done is it so broken? Is it so shattered that there's no hope? But all of that, everything that we just looked at was introduction to chapter 12. In chapter 12, God is going to take an ordinary man and he's going to give him a new name and that name is Abraham. And he's going to say, hey, Abraham, with you, I'm going to start all over again. I'm going to start a whole new deal. We're going to create our own nation. It's going to be a nation called Israel. Why are we doing this? Because the dream isn't dead. God says, I'm going to redeem the entire human race. And over and over comes this promise. God says, I am the Lord. I will free you from being slaves to whatever it is. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. It's interesting, years and years later, Job makes a similar statement. In Job 19, verse 25, he, Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives. And it's like he's saying, that's exactly what I need. I don't need more intelligence. I don't need more cleverness. I don't need more strength. I need a Redeemer. See, we are a lot like Adam and Eve. We are a lot like Cain and Abel. We build the Tower of Babel in our lives all the time. But then comes this promise of redemption, and it comes from way beyond us. We can't save ourselves. And the whole point of this introduction is to say that God hasn't given up on anybody yet. And one day, at just the right time, God is going to send a Redeemer. But here's the thing. A price must be paid for redemption. Perfect timing. That was good. I like that. Marvin, can we work that in? To yeah, he's going to work on that. You don't underestimate what Marvin can do with sounds, okay? This is going to be a little bit of a loose association, but I want you to ha kind of hang with me here. I want you to turn to the person next to you, and I want the two of you together to take a guess at something, okay? Back in the 1960s, what do you think was the single largest publication available in the U.S.? Go ahead, talk to each other. Take, it, it could be a book, a magazine, a published product of some kind, but it was the biggest publication in the 1960s. Okay? Take a guess. I'll help you. It wasn't a book. It wasn't a magazine. It was actually a catalog. 
And if you're thinking that it's the J.C. Penney Christmas catalog, which I always look forward to every year because I'm going to make my Christmas list, you're wrong. You're wrong. It was published by a company called Sperry and Hutchison, better known as S and H. Some of you are old enough to remember S and H green stamps. This is all historical. You can check this out for yourself. You would save up these little green stamps, okay? Now you're going, well, I don't understand. I, let me tell you something. This is how big S&H was back in the 60s. S&H printed three times more stamps than the United States Post Office. They published enough catalogs to more than circle the globe. Okay? And what in the world were people getting all excited about? These were just stamps, right? But they were more than just stamps. If you saved enough stamps, you could get a new toaster. You could get an appliance. My parents got camping equipment with their stamps. You could do amazing stuff. This is for real. I checked this out. There was a school in Erie, Pennsylvania, who saved 5.4 million green stamps and bought two gorillas for their local zoo. With green stamps, okay? These were stamps that weren't just stamps. And you could take your stamps, and I remember going to my, with my parents, to a place called the Redemption Center. Yeah. And you could redeem your stamps for something wonderful. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but s and is still around. So if you find some green stamps in the attic or tucked into somebody's old Bible, you can now go online and redeem those stamps. No kidding. It's not too late if you find them, all right? s and is still in the redemption business after all these years. Now, let's bring it back to us. With endless patience, at infinite cost to himself, God has been waiting since the beginning of history. He's waiting, he's aching, he's loving until one day at just the right time he would send to this earth an offspring. If you follow the line, it's an offspring of Eve. God sent him to a redemption center on a hill called Calvary. And by the way, there was only one item in God's catalog. He said, I want one of you, and I want one of you, and I want one of you, and I want one of you. I want you so much. This is the story of the world. This is our story. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. It says, for he, this is our God, he has rescued us. We couldn't do it ourselves. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves in whom we have, what's the word? Redemption, the forgiveness of sins. There is a redemption center. And God says what He's been saying to the human race all along. Why don't you come into the redemption center? Why don't you trade that old guilt for a little forgiveness? Why don't you trade your old sinful life for redeemed life? Why don't you tr trade your guilt and your regret for some hope? Why won't you trade your despair for some faith? What he's really saying is, why don't you just come home? Now, why would God do that? Why would God make a trade like that? It's because somebody paid a price. It's because there is a redeemer. That's the story of the world that we sometimes can barely hope that it's real because it's a story of a God who is a redeeming God. He takes messes in people's lives. He takes stuff that's shattered. He takes broken people of which we are all part, people that nobody can fix. And God says, bring it to me. Bring it to the redemption center and I'll redeem it. I've paid the price and I'm still in the redeeming business. That's our God. Listen to me, folks. There is no story like a redemption story. 
And I wanted to start this series off with a picture of what that looks like. This is a picture of the heart of our God. He is a redeemer. I think we could all agree that our world is a mess. Amen? But then there's God. He looks at the mess and he goes, you know what? I'll cover your shame. I'll protect your lives. I'll make a promise. I'll give you the very best that I have. I will pay the ultimate price. As you see, there's no story in the world like a story of redemption. And it can be our story. Our God is in the redeeming business. This right here, this is a miniature redemptive center. This is a redemptive community. Right here, this place we call home. This is where some of us have learned that God is still in the redeeming business. He longs to redeem us. So the message today very clearly is this. God says, you can come home. You can come home to God's family. You can come home to the place where you belong. Would you bow your heads in prayer, please, with me? Father in heaven, I pray for those of us that are here today who need to hear this. Father, I believe there's somebody in this room this morning that is in need of redemption. Might be all of us. So Father, I ask that you would speak into that person's heart or maybe into all of our hearts so that we would understand we don't have to stand off at a distance. We don't have to continue that moving east. We can come home. And Father, if that's what they need to do today, please let them speak that in their heart that they would say to you, God, I'm a sinner. I'm in need of a savior. I need somebody that can redeem me. And I pray that they would say that to you this morning because I know the moment they do that you're gonna rush right to them and you're gonna cover them and you're gonna pick them up and you're gonna make things right again and you're gonna lead our lives. Thank you, Father, for all that you do for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. Would you stand with me, please, for our closing song?